thing that I see so much is that we fight each other instead of working together. And it's to the detriment of the industry when we can't come together and say, for the good of the industry, we all need to adopt a certain code that we're going to. I'd rather have your friendship than have your freight. That was the voice of Silver Creek Transportation's Jason Callan, speaking to what he sees as an essential challenge in the highly competitive trucking industry for small fleet owners looking to lead by example and balance that competition with a rising tide floats all boats kind of mentality. Easier said than done, of course, but Cowan, the small fleet champ, announced at the annual conference of the National Association of Small Trucking Companies earlier this month, he had a sense of peer-to-peer -peer respect, friendship even, among competitors is essential to the quote-unquote code by which he and his team operate. Cowan was speaking as part of a big roundtable conversation uh, with the others among our Small Fleet Champ finalists there at the Nastic Show in Nashville. Uh, my name is Karen Hallahan. I'm with Hallahan Transport. Robert Hallahan with Hallahan Transport. Penny Cowan, Silver Creek Transportation. Nick Hewitt, Professional Transportation. I'm Todd Dills, your host as usual for this edition of the Overdrive Radio Podcast, where we're going to run through a talk around trucking business best practice about challenges, the rise of electronic logging devices and changes in the brokerage world all three of these finalists have grappled with over the years and in some cases uh, adapted to. Direct customer relations is a substantial part of the talk, including the sense that competitors working together presents the possibility of real value for the future of trucking, not least in creating the conditions for dividends in the popular image of the business so detrimental to bedrock conditions for everyone involved. That's a big priority for everyone in the discussion, particularly the avoidance of self-inflicted wounds that Nick Hewitt, owner of Oregon-based Professional Transportation Services Incorporated, or PTSI, identified. So much prejudice, pre we all know this, there's so much prejudice towards trucking right now, and unfortunately, we as an industry have earned that prejudice. We really have. You know, by trucks tailgating. I mean, I've been out on the road lately a lot, and I've had other truckers. I mean, you couldn't put a smart car between me and them. Yeah. And and I tell all my guys when I hire on, I said, you know, we'll we'll put up a fair amount, but the fastest way to get fired is to, is for me to see you tailgate. Avoiding those self-inflicted wounds is a big priority for Hallahan Transport too, according to Karen Hallahan. So you are representing a name that's on your door. You don't have to be in a suit, but be clean, be presentable, be respectful. Right. You get my button up shirts. Yeah, just be a nice brand to yeah. help change yeah. that look or that image of what people think truckers are. Because right. one of the best things I hear, I know we, we go up to uh, Sutherland to load beams to go east. Now, all of our trucks are step decks and they really don't like loading those beams on step decks. You know, we have load lovers and all, but still they don't like loading our step decks. And I went in there to load a load where a driver was taking some time off and I was going to take it back to the yard. And a guy came up and said, you know, I said, we hate your traders, but we love your drivers. Now that, I might wager, is exactly what any owner wants to hear from a customer. Trucking associations play a role in bringing disparate owners together around tackling big issues like these. And For some of our finalists, the NASDAQ event where we were speaking was a first for them. But Jason Cowan, owner of Henderson, Kentucky-based Silver Creek, lauded the association's efforts over the longer term with reference to NASDAQ leader David Owen. I want to thank David for, you know, putting this together. I know he has spent a lot of years uh, fighting for our industry and doing things and and, you know, he, when I was uh, first in business, you know, that the nasty fuel card was, that was just like, wow, that's one of the great, we came and came down, came to the conference and yeah. said, hey, get this fuel card. And, How long has it been? Oh, four, yeah, four or four five years ago yeah. when I first got that fuel card after we gained some trucks. And it was like, man, this is it was really a savings for us. It really helped us. And then, you know, be able to pick up a phone call yeah. and say, hey, need this or that. And so, you know. Hopefully our team's benefiting upstairs as we speak through the, some of the things that they provide. So really appreciate it. David and his team. Before we jump right into the meat of the conversation today with each owner's advice, the one truck independents among you who are thinking about growth beyond that single truck, 
Here's a brief word from Overdrive Radio's sponsor. First Guard provides commercial truck insurance to leased owner operators done right. As we've done for more than 80 years, we provide physical damage and non-trucking. Many companies make you pay up to six months of insurance premiums up front, but not First Guard. We bill monthly, so you get quality insurance without needing to pay a lot of cash up front. Go to firstguard.com. That's one S T guard.com. First Guard. We speak trucker. Let's talk. Ladies and gentlemen, Lacrosse, Wisconsin-based Hallahan Transport's Rob Hallahan. And I think we're probably all going to have different answers to that because <laughs> uh, my opinion is don't ever just jump into thinking you're going to go get your authority and become a carrier. You know, learn everything about the job first. Be a driver for ten years for a company. You know, do, buy a truck and lease on to somebody. Learn how. Learn. Learn what's going on in the back office and and what you know ask questions you know not just on other drivers but the owner of the company you know see if he'll lend you advice you know things like that know what you're doing before you just go and get your authority yeah. because that's what i see happen a lot of these guys will go, average authority only lasts uh the first eight to 12 months and then they're out of business bankrupt or just gave up and said i can't do it so went back to leasing or yeah to being company driver. I mean, you, you, you are the most recent uh, kind of convert among all, <laughs> all uh, the everybody here in terms of having been a one truck guy just for uh, three years ago, three or four years ago. Was that the first yeah. time you had done it or was that the second time? Third. That was the third time. Okay. That was the third. But I was a lease operator. You know, I, yeah. I, I would, I lease purchased my first truck. I lease purchased it from Schneider, yeah. you know, and that was, you know, just didn't work out things didn't work and then I then I bought a truck and leased on to somebody and I did really well with that until you know I had some other underlying issues with a bankruptcy and divorce and things like that which pushed me out of it but but yeah I, I tried it three times before I actually succeeded at it this is the first time with your authority this is my first time with my authority yes yes and and it's working I mean, yeah. What 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 do you attribute the difference to? I guess. Well, I'm a lot older now. <laughs> I'm a lot wiser now. I I learned the business you more now. It. You know, I asked questions. You know, because when I when when the first time I did it, you know, I went from a company driver who didn't know nothing to I'm going to buy a truck and be rich. You know. Yeah, I was rich for a little while. You know, I bought all kinds of stuff for myself. <laughs> you know and it didn't that didn't work out because i didn't that's what I, you know i've told you before i didn't know that that money was for the truck that wasn't for me you know i learned the hard way and i see a lot of people learning the hard way that's why i don't i'd like to change that so people you know don't learn the hard way well, they, they actually learn the business first yeah and then go out and do it because if you know the business first it's going to save you a lot in the future yeah and there's opportunity there you know. Uh, in today's world. I think a lot of us jump in this industry because we like trucks yep. or we're enamored with it, with the trucks or the trucking and you have to put the trucker aside and learn the business side. And again, Jason Callen of Silver Creek Transportation. Know your numbers, know what's coming in, how to do budgets and you know we've created what we think like a team approach where we just you know you have to treat it like a business like you said you know the, this belongs to the truck, this is ours and Right. And, you know, you have to know what the difference is, and how how to be able to, to you know, project this is what I'm going to need. Right. You can be making profits. You can have lots of work. But, you know, you can also be broke and not know it if you don't know what your numbers are. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah, some, and a lot of it, like you said, is uh, having the having that team uh, support. Tell me a little bit about, like, uh, you know, aside from folks that are driving for you, uh, how many team members are there, and I mean, how do you guys split up the? How do you decide who does what? You know, we have two basic models. We have a team model where we have this just our back, what we call I guess back office staff. So yeah. safety director, you know, the bookkeeper, office manager, dispatch, and maintenance. We meet real regular with those guys. You know, a couple times a month. Really should do it more often, but a couple times a month we get together. This is what's going on. Then once a month, I've assembled a board. Uh, uh, it also has our accountant that comes in for the afternoon. Uh, a couple guys I trust that retired, different mm -hmm. things like that, that I talked to when we were doing this and put together a board. So 
what that does is that, you know, you always have somebody to help you see your blind spots. And so you know, I'm all gung-ho about all oh, this opportunity or that. They pulled me back and say, hey, let's look at this, look at the numbers. And, and through that, we've been able to tweak our numbers and tweak some of the systems we use to, you know, to bid and to do things for okay. our customers. And it's helped us to fine tune, hey, this is what we need to be to be profitable. This is what we need. This is where we want to go because we really set a vision to, you know, we always said in our company, we don't want to grow a big company. We want to grow big people. And so that's, you know, right. we energize or I try to energize our team to what are you doing this year for personal growth? What are you doing to grow yourself? It's not just a job. I'm not just a truck driver. I'm not just a anything. I've got a purpose. Right. And that's what we're trying to fulfill. Right. We've talked with Rob a good bit about the, uh, the kind of hand up. And he talked about it a little bit there. Uh, he's given to guys that are, are interested to kind of go out and buy the truck. Nick, you've kind of gone in the opposite direction in a certain sense in terms of um, like when you got, when you inherited, bought this, this, this company that well, pretty much inherited there. In, inherited. Yeah. Cause you, you were like their, you were like their top sales guy. You, you were responsible for almost all their business and then had the opportunity to basically take the company over. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at that point there was a group of owner operators that started with you, but today mostly company drivers, right? And the biggest key was, and, and margins were definitely thinner back then, was our our owner operators, as hard as we pushed them, they were not taking care of their trucks to the point that they should have. Okay. And we actually got enough. We never had any major violations, but enough small ones that all of a sudden, bang, we, we drew an audit and we got put on conditional. Right. And that... That really made me sit up and going, well, this is this is not where I wanted to go. And the only way to really control that was to own the trucks. Right. And and we, we moved in that direction because our owner operators were getting, uh, they themselves were getting older and they just didn't want to replace their equipment because yeah. they were close enough to the finish line yeah. uh, that they just didn't want to. Um, so we we went with with company trucks, and that for us has has paid off. Right. And when you got how long ago was that conditional rating? Was it like maybe a decade ago or so? I, I about, think, yeah, I think we it, talked about it. Before. Yeah, it was about ten years ago, yeah. and, and it, it it really uh, I wasn't expecting it. Right. Uh, all of a sudden, this guy named uh, Walter Rich came in, and he plopped down his you know he just showed up. Unannounced. Unannounced, really. And he showed up and he said, I am the biggest, baddest, toughest DOT auditor in the country. And the previous year, he'd gone to a nationwide contest that was actually in Wisconsin, <laughs> and he won it. He was the biggest, baddest, toughest <laughs> auditor in the so country. He, he was speaking <laughs> the truth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we, today, are very good friends. Okay. Uh, because he did point out where we really needed to do a lot better than we were doing. And since then, our safety rating has been terrific. And, uh, you know, things, things, are, things are much, much better. And we have a much stricter eye on safety. Okay. We actually went to ELDs four years before we needed to. Okay. Was that part of the deal to get out of the conditional rating? I no, it, it, it was not. It, it was absolutely a, yeah. wasn't. That was strictly my choice. Right. I looked at it. I knew, I knew it was coming, and yeah. and I didn't want to wait till the last minute, and all of a sudden go to ELDs right. and 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 figure out what it's going to do to our company. I wanted to know what it was going to do to our company yeah, for. Uh, and I can tell you unequivocally, we did lose some production. No question about it, no. but it made us a better, safer company, and the numbers prove that out. And I would not want to go back to paper loans. I turned to Rob Hallahan here with a bit of a chuckle. Hallahan and I actually met way back in 2017 when he was a one truck carrier and participating in the earliest Washington DC held protests of the ELD mandate. The next time we spoke, he was operating his company with a few trucks and had become one of those slightly early adopters of ELDs himself with the keep trucking system, which he found useful in a variety of ways. I got him and man, I told him, I said, I'm actually not here to protest them, <laughs> yeah. but I'll support the people who don't want them. 
Yeah. If you don't want them, that should be your choice not to want them. I, I agree. Me with a business and having having several trucks, at that point it was a safety to me to have them in the trucks because I knew that the guys couldn't be cheating their logs, and if they got in an accident, it was going to be it wasn't going to come back and sue you because you weren't supposed to be there. Yeah, you know. So at that point, I wanted them, and there was no way they were coming out of our trucks. Yeah. <laughs> No, and I, and it makes it easier for the you know in the office doing your doing yeah. your IFTA, the guys are idling you know they can see how you know hey we need to work on getting our our, our uh, mile per gallon down and and start running in you know your fourteen seventy five range you know I because I can I can look at everything how how fast your your you know mm-hmm. uh, your speed on the truck versus your gear ratio you know to what's your RPMs I can look at all of that mm-hmm. and and I can train the drivers off of that too like hey you know you're running too low of a gear or right. you're running too high of a gear you have cameras in your trucks i do not now and i will because uh, you went with sam sarah i did yeah and i i'm also with sam sarah and so we we running. just chose the just the forward facing camera what we, have we don't facing. we don't have it and that forward facing camera i would never give that up at that at, at this point uh we had a guy just two days ago uh a pickup with an RV uh, went past us and just came over and hit us. Uh, and you know, if we hadn't had that camera, I would have been going, "All right, driver, what did right. you do?" You know, but and there it was, right. and uh, I could actually show you that video right now. And, and I understand that part of it, but what what a lot of people don't understand is that camera is placed in a position where the driver's eyes aren't placed. So if the camera is up here in the window. And then you look at the video on 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 a screen. It actually looks like the driver should have braked sooner, should have avoided the accident, should should have been able to see that that car's turn signal was on and was coming over. But if you set yourself back in the driver's seat, you don't see all of that. Mm-hmm. So so we had one yeah. we had one going through Georgia through going through Atlanta and he had it on dash cam. Lady's dog jumped into her lap and when it jumped into her lap, she swerved over, cut in front of him. He hit the back end of the truck or back end of the car, and then she t- continued to cross the lane into the next lane and got off on an exit ramp. Well, in the video that he sent me, it looked like he was gaining speed, like he sped up to try to hit her. Wow. Where he really didn't even see her, it, but the but the camera is so high in the windshield that okay. it looked that way. These same Sarah cams, if, 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 right in the video in the corner, it'll show you exactly how fast he's going, right in the video, and so you can see, see if they see. speed up or slow down or or what or what's going on with it. Um, it it is such a useful tool, right. and yeah. uh, also you can get all the other data that's all tied together. Mm-hmm. I just feel that sometimes it can put you in this position where where you look like you were at fault because the camera saw something you didn't see. No. But I've also used it for for coaching. Uh, yeah. We had a driver in North Dakota, uh, another truck passing him, you know, because our trucks are limited at seventy, and and a lot of people's are limited there. And this this truck was trying to pass him, was taking forever to do it, and he was just going all over the place, coming into his... He was clearly texting. Right. All right. Um, now, no accident happened, but I actually used that video. I said, okay, I said, so tell me what's going on here. And they said, well, that driver's clearly out of control, this, that, and the other. I said, okay, what did our driver do wrong? He said, well, nothing. He didn't slow down. He didn't extract himself from the situation when it was clear that there was a problem. Right. See, and, that, and, and that's, that's what I see in a lot yeah. of videos. A lot of these videos that I see, well, you know, this person cut across the line. It's like, yeah. well, why didn't that truck slow down? But then I don't put myself in that driver's seat where he's further away from the windshield and don't see that car down there. You know, if you, if yeah, you can't this, see that car, this was another tractor trailer. right? Yeah. We got lucky, and yeah. and the lady actually admitted that the dog jumped in her lap and she swerved into the path of the truck. Well, she ended up getting a ticket for um, failure to maintain her lane and illegal lane change. So, her insurance paid for our truck. We got lucky there, but it's still a reportable accident. Had on a record. video, maybe she would have gone the other way. Right? Yeah. yeah. 
I don't know. I, I had an attorney one time tell me, don't ever tell the police officer that you have video. Don't ever tell them you have the video. Let the attorneys look at the videos first because they'll eliminate everything else except for what the cop needs to see. But if you tell them yeah. you have a video right away, they're going to, they, they, they have I, access I, to that whole video. I, I actually disagree with that. For, for a while, uh, we get our insurance through Great West mm -hmm. and they're, they're fantastic. Best insurance company That's ever. That's your insurance company mm -hmm. too. Um, for a while, we had a guy who was a 30 year state trooper as our West Coast safety guy. It turned out we knew each other from way back. Uh, I'll tell you the story some other time because it's windy. <laughs> uh, but we, we did know each other and we're great friends to this day. A and he will tell you as a state trooper that when he's reviewed videos from trucks, that 98% that of the time he sees, this, he sees that the truck is not at fault. Right. And, and, and that's the end of the story right there. So we're, we're, I feel differently. I think if the trooper wants to see the video, uh, absolutely, the, right. the trooper should, because it's well, going to exonerate the truck. Really, realistically, you would, you would think that they would make something that sees the driver's view. Yeah, that now, makes sense. Of, like, yeah. I don't like the, the video cameras that they have the camera like outside the vehicle on the front of the truck. The driver can't see all that. You know, right. so it, it, shows, it shows a wider view picture. And, and it shows, you know, that, that this person's got his turn signal on for right. for 100 yards and it finally comes over and the driver had no idea he was coming over. Right. Switching gears a little bit, um, you know, one of the things that that sort of uh, is a common theme in, in any, you know, we had all 10, 10 stories from all the semifinals this year. Everything, uh, is a common thread there is like, is an owner that is um, particularly adept at kind of customer relationship management. Um, not something you really have to do a lot of if you're just a company driver, although, uh, or even a leased owner operator if you're dedicated to a particular fleet, and let, and with the exception of the fact that, you know, you, you have a relationship with your employer who is sort of like your customer, I guess. But, but um, you know, I was wondering if each of you could kind of give me a, a think about the, the customer uh, that you sort of have the best relationship with and and kind of how you got there. You know, like what, uh, how did it, how did it start? Uh, how did it go from just kind of, you know, you, you wanted, you want to work, move this, move this customer's freight to where you are with that person today? I think all of us have the same answer there, and and, and it and it, it is simply good, honest, open communication. Okay. Particularly when things go wrong, you need to be on the phone, and say, "Hey, this is what's going on, and and we're not going to be able to meet your uh, schedule or criteria or whatever." I said, right. "But this is, and but have a back as soon as you tell them that." Said, "This is what we can do. What do you think?" Just open, honest straightforward communication right. and that's that's true with all of us yeah. to me it doesn't matter what business you're in you're in the people business if we're trucking if we're farming if we're picking apples you know building cars whatever it is you're in the people business right. on both sides so you have to build those relationships and that is very true it's built on honest you know what are you going to do i'm going to do what i say i'm going to do uh, we have some some of the, one of the largest customers that we have uh, we got because our local band needed a trailer on Saturday to pull their equipment. And they were renting, you know, just rental trucks every week. And they came to us and said, hey, you think you just let us borrow a trailer? And so we actually put a trailer together for them, put their name on it, oh, yeah. and, you know, did it for them. And then one of the band dads just happened, just happened to be uh, the plant manager for this corporation who then picked up the phone at the end of the season and said, hey. Wow. And uh, we've got to be just, you know, really good friends through the years, just, yeah. you know, just to build. But it's all about building relationships, everything that you do. What, you know, how can we, how can we build that? I, uh, we never want to get in a, enough of a corporate mindset where we lose our soul and don't, you know, take care of our customers. And right. they know who we are when we show up or, right. or vice versa. That's yeah. what we're looking like for. That personal touch is, um, you know, it's, it's something that smaller companies sort of yeah. have a natural advantage in. 
I guess, but um, you just can't really say that. And, and it's just about going above and beyond expectations. One of the things that he and I can do, which 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 I think is a huge sales tool, with our ELDs, I can click on a truck, click on share, it creates a link, and I can email that link to anybody, and they can follow that truck. They know exactly where their load is at all the time, and my customers love that. PTSI's Nick Hewitt uh, here was referring to a feature of the Samsara ELD product that both PTSI and Jason Callen with Silver Creek are utilizing. Rob Hallahan noted uh, Keep Trucking has a similar feature that helps give a window onto a load's progress. A key customer relations tool greasing the skids of expectations management without a lot of Herculean effort in the back office or on the part of a driver even. Managing those exceptions on any load, though, can be a challenge. Allahan went on to say, but there's opportunity in those exceptions when it comes to... Proving yourself to them is, you know, that that's that's the first step. You know, you got to prove yourself to them. Otherwise, you're just another trucking company, you know. Right. So, like, as soon as something happens, like you said, you know, communicate with them, but also back yourself up. You know, if I'd have been a single owner operator with one truck trying to run my own business and broke down yeah you can call them and tell them you broke down but what are you going to do about it right. you're down yeah, what's, where what's your backup plan? it's been we've been lucky enough that we've all every every breakdown we've ever had we've had other trucks in the area or i've had trucks that weren't under loads that could drop their trailer and deadhead right. you know we might have to deadhead 700 miles to go recover yeah. a truck but yeah. we're going to do it you know we're not going to call them up and say hey i don't know what to do because we got a truck that's broke down and he's got your load yeah. on it but he's going to be down for four days so your load's going to be late <laughs> never ever yeah. been late for a load we will do what we got to do to get it there right. so you know once you can prove it to them like that then 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 you're then you got to work on like your relationship with that broker or that customer, or the, you know, whoever. So I've, I've got relationships with some of my customers where they call me up just out of the blue and be like, Hey, I have a question, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it's like totally off the record, but just oh, we're yeah. friends hey, and we're talking. Your brain. I've, I've heard know, that. So long, I've, gone, your brain for a minute. I've <laughs> gone and yeah. taken customers out on the trail rides, you know, and stuff like that. You know, I mean, we're, you know, have lunch with their family, you know, things like that, you know, <laughs> you'll never lose that customer. Right. As long as, yeah, as long as you continue to do those things. You know, that, they'll call me, you know, just call me on the weekends to see how we're doing, you know, <laughs> Hey, how's it going? You busy? We got a little extra work or, right. you know, if you have a truck available, can you help me out? You know, and it's, it's not like you're expected to, but it's just a, you know, the friendship thing, you know, you build a friendship with them too. So when it comes to, you know, the current place where you, all of you guys are with your respective businesses, um, what, what do you feel like is your, you know, the, the most difficult thing that you're trying to overcome that has been a challenge uh, for you? And how do you feel like you're going to solve it? I think all of us had the same real issue and, and, that, and that's personnel. I uh, and and I don't know how we're going to solve this. I know uh, you know I'm, I'm also members of the ATA and OTA, and that that's the key topic always. Those acronyms Nick Hewitt referenced there were for the American Trucking Associations and state member organization, the Oregon Trucking Association. Hewitt thought back a decade or so to a conversation with the head of a much larger fleet to whom he put what he felt was. Something of a final solution to difficulties attracting drivers. Better pay. That larger fleet rep didn't take the comment well, Hewitt said. And he turned bright red in the face, did a 180 degree turn before he said it. He said, I pay my people really well, which was not true at the time. And he, he did not about face and would not talk to me the rest of the evening. <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the old thing, right? But... Uh, we have seen pay going go up. I mean, I know owner operators, uh, anyways, that are out on their own or have generally. You know, there's challenges, of course, but people are doing yeah. better, people are doing better than they sort of ever have been uh, right at this now. moment. But company drivers, it's gone up yeah. here and there. But but you know what? 
But we're still it, having the problems. Yeah, still it, having it, problems it, even it, worse it, than it, it was. It's going to be a while because yeah. young people don't want to go into the business because our society has changed so much, our yeah, culture right. has changed so much, and people just don't want to be away from home. And that's an issue. So we have to reorganize to where we're not doing this cross-country trucking, which is pretty much all I'm doing. That's all you're doing at this point, yeah. And because uh, I figured out a long time ago, the, the more, the less that you load and unload, the more yep. uptime you have and the, and the more profitable your truck is. But you know, our guys are out an average of two weeks. And you know what? In today's society, that's too long. Yeah, the the um, it, it's yeah, it's about the culture that I think that you try to have as as a company because you know the rates are going to come and go. We're going to see those cycles. Right. We're going to see people. We've we've regulated ourselves into a corner uh, in so many areas. You know, even going back into the '90s with the CDL that cut out a group of a whole group of drivers, but yet there was a big enough pool that were mm-hmm. you know young, like you know, because I came about in during that time. Right. And so now, you know, we say, okay, you can't get in a truck till you're 23. So you have a young man, young woman that graduates high school, they want to drive, they've got six years to go. They, they find another career, they're doing something else. Right. And then, yeah, like I said, we don't want to leave them out for three weeks at a time. And, and by that time, they found something yeah. else to do. They found something. And so then I think there again, if we go back to the technology that we have, one of the biggest complaints that we hear is, you know, okay, I take a truck and it sits at the dock for two or three hours at a shipper and we have to try to recover that either from our customer or a broker and we have to turn around what's fair to the driver that they're sitting you know we have the technology to almost pay them however we'd like whether it's by the hour we can you know do sure. that so if a, a driver puts in 70 hours on his clock a week we can make sure he's compensated for that right. i think we're going to see those things as technology advances but right. it's for us uh I think it's would be you know, the driver or maybe the regulations that, you know, they just uh, layer tax on, you know, we pay a tax to have the privilege to get a piece of paper to pay another tax to have the privilege to pay the third tax, you know. I mean, that's all. That's also one of the issues in trucking. I, I don't know if the statistic is, is currently true, but I knew five years ago it was true. The average profit on a, a trucking company was about 2.8% on gross receipts. That is a razor thin margin, and it doesn't take too big an off fully to make that go away. Yeah. And, and that's something else that we've done to ourselves over the years. And and we... By, by the rates being bid mm-hmm. down far too low. That's a little bit that is yeah. happening for us now in that regard, it's, right? Well, but what's going to happen now, though, is, okay, and, and I see this happening. It, it's going to happen. We already have a problem where they're not making enough money. So you see these companies that are starting to raise the rates, okay, and they're raising, they're raising the, the trucker, you know, they're raising his pay. Okay, what's going to happen when those rates rebound and they start to come back down again, but they've already promised this driver that he's going to make this much money. He's going to quit because he's not going to want to, decrease in pay so then there's going to be even bigger driver shortage because they went at such companies mind you hallahan noted broadly speaking as he went on to note six years i, I still that. don't think there is a shortage i don't believe there's <laughs> well, a driver shortage all right. there's a there's an experienced driver shortage yeah there's Hopefully. a training shortage hewitt did contrast the situation 10 years ago to today though back then there wasn't a driver shortage because was there any freight sitting at the dock? Yes, right. if you had right. more drivers, you could haul more freight, but there was no right. freight right. sitting at the dock right. not being hauled. There is now. Right. I agree with that. That is true. Yeah. I would think. I used to say we don't have an industry shortage. We may have an individual company shortage mm-hmm. well, of drivers, but too. we were moving all the freight now. Right. Yeah. Like, because, yeah, you know, you'd have a customer before COVID. They call and say, I need you to move my widgets. You're like, oh, I can't get to it. Okay, no problem. I'll get somebody else. And right. now they're coming back going, well, when can you get here? When can, and what's <laughs> it going to cost? Yeah, and what's yeah. it going to cost me? Yeah. What's, what are those things? But I think one thing the trucking industry needs to do, I guess it's cliche, but need to work together. The thing that I see so much is that we fight each other instead of working together. And it's to the detriment of the industry when we can't come together and say, for the good of the industry, we all need to adopt a certain code that we're going to, And actually, that's what organizations like this are really good for. 
The National Association of Small Trucking Companies, Hewitt meant. We were talking during NASTIC's annual conference, as noted, where the small fleet champ was announced earlier this month. I asked for examples of that code Silver Creek's Jason Cowan mentioned. Examples of that we're all in this together sort of spirit, and how it actually plays out in the real worlds of the three businesses here. Here's what Nick Hewitt offered. And there's a couple companies I work with uh, pretty well. One is uh, Levitt's Freight, which is now part of the Dasky Group up there. Okay, right. Uh, they're, they're, you know, anytime we get freight that we're not equipped to haul, I turn it over to my friend up there at Levitt's. And then anytime, because we're all 53-foot step decks, he gets step decks freight and he can't move it, he just turns the customer over to us right. and has them call us. Um, we do the same thing with uh, Ram Trucking, which is also up in up in the Eugene area. And this is yeah, and, and it's kind of just it's just an it's just an informal like yeah. we know we know we all know each other. I know he can do this. Go call him. You know, and, right? and and we we do that all the time, and it's done for us, and that's a good way to work together. And not cut each other's throats. Exactly. Yeah. To to gain that customer, which just, yeah. we've dealt with that. Karen Hallahan of Hallahan Transport. Yeah. You know, the people yeah. you wouldn't think that that would do that. And then, you know, we lose that customer. Yeah. Why would you do that? You're mm -hmm. both trying to put the same food on your table and keep the same amount of professionalism. And so you just have to work together. If you were to call Rob, Rob would be like, well, here's what I'll do it for if that's what you're doing. You know, he's not out to cut you. Yeah. He's out to help. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's all the same. We're going to pick up a step deck load for Bellavance Trucking up in Vermont. Bellavance is based in Vermont. And they're a hundred plus truck fleet, but we have a good relationship with them, and they aren't equipped to do this. We are, and they just and they just said, "What will you do it for?" It's going to San Francisco, that area, and we told them, and 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 we're doing the load for them, and where you go, and we work back and forth quite a bit. I think coming from an agricultural background when I was young, I used to watch a lot of the old old farmers and they uh, if a farm came up and someone wanted to rent some ground they wouldn't take it from the other farmer until that farmer said i'm done with it or it's okay you can right. do that and so we brought that philosophy into you know because we're in a small town and that's uh we believe in that hey i've got to live in this town so I, i'm not out to make everybody mad just because i want i'd rather have your friendship than have your freight mm -hmm. and it, you know that may cost us some things you know we may not be as aggressive on some things but if like i know that. if i know that's your haul and you've had that haul since we right. were little you know and they call me uh you know that's not something that we're going to pursue you know because it's just not what we want to do and uh, you know there's i, I guess that going back to that that's the trucking side of me first you know a lot of these guys i admire i grew up watching them and i'm not in it to and there's so and, much to do it wouldn't be like it's not like we're in and market, and, and you know. actually, I think a large part in trucking that's true. What has changed the culture, though, is the brokers. Okay. Uh, brokers kind of left their ethics at home when they when they start work, and and uh, I have met more people, more highly unethical people that were brokers right. than than any other profession I've ever been around. And I think that goes, a lot of that goes down to where the broker used to be a person of you talk to the broker right. anymore. You never, never talk to the broker anymore. You talk to this kid that's two years out of high school and he's reading off of a piece of paper what he's told to do for his job and the broker's out golfing and he's going to, he, he, he's, he's, the load might pay $3,000 and he's told you need to try to get rid of it for 1500 and he's going to try all day long to lie to you every way he can get you to believe that that's only a $1,500 load. And by the end of the day, when they don't cover it, the broker calls me and says, hey, did you get that load covered yet? No, but I need a 2200 to get somebody to do it. Okay, give it to them. That's that's where brokerages yeah. went. Because uh, we're, we're all old enough to remember when brokers weren't a thing at all. Right. I, if you took somebody else's <laughs> load, you either interlined or you did a trip lease, which was quite a chore because or you, paid you had to get the gold book the yeah gold book. yeah <laughs> uh and, and things 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 have just changed dramatically that's been ongoing since the rise of the internet in the 1990s and the flood of new brokerages that spawned and, and already existing companies adapting and getting bigger and bigger and bigger at once those new dynamics created new opportunities ptsi itself operates a steadily growing brokerage 
it under a very different model than the kind of beat the rate down telephone jockeying Rob Hallahan referenced. It's a far different yeah. model, and and uh, we we you know I talk with my guys on a very regular basis, and and <coughs> you know ethics are a huge part of what we want to do, and uh, you know none of us have to get rich; we just have to make a living. No. I guess because when he's on the phone with a broker. He tries to school him. Are you telling me this load pays this much? Let me do the math for you. Here's how many miles it is. This is how much a gallon of fuel is. This is the time it takes. This is what it costs to stop and shower if it's an overnight. He totally breaks it down, and then he'll put him on speaker so I can hear him. At the end of the phone call, well, sir, I'm sorry. I wasted your time. You're right. I need to pay more than that. I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you for that. You know, whatever. <laughs> he educates them because he's, like he said, they're reading cue cards. I, I want to go to work. And they, yeah. <laughs> he needs to have hidden cameras in his office of when he's can, talking can you, to people. calls you and says he's got 2,000. Doesn't mean he doesn't have four. Right. Mm -hmm. He does have four. Mm -hmm. He's just telling you he has two. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was going to tell you, if you decide to get your broker's license, go back to Great West. It's not cheap. But get contingent cargo. You okay. really need to have yeah. that. Yes. I'm with Great West. I'm too. Yeah, Great West is, I I don't even shop insurance because I know that if I have a serious problem, and like all of us we have over the years, they have absolutely been in my corner, 100%. Right. Uh, we had a bad accident in 2018, and, and they the last person hired one of these hammer lawyers oh, yeah. and and was going after us for you know huge yeah. sum clear suits. yeah and uh, great west was in our corner and we and we got through it yeah not all insurance companies are bad nor are brokers as the hallahans wanted to make clear yeah, there's times brokers. where i'd sometimes rather do brokerage freight than a customer freight <laughs> yeah. you know you were talking and, about city brewery right like yeah, yeah i would not, i would i do everything through a broker for city yeah. brewery because yeah. you've seen how i know how they treat their carriers I, and they only have a few carriers left that'll even haul for them you know but but yeah they're not all bad you know there's no, some and, 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 yeah <laughs> i mean there there definitely are are some good brokers yeah. some brokers we love doing business with yeah. yes uh and as a small carrier brokers have to be part, part of this uh, part of our, our our business model in the long run, Jason Cowan said, a small fleet owner's success in acquiring and managing customers will hinge on the ability to set aside personal attachments to this or that load, to this or that type of freight, and really focus on what's right for the business long term. That's key, he said, to growth. That, that's another thing you're looking at when you're in a small trucking company. You tend to look at this as your baby, so things are more personal. So you look at, oh, I like doing this job, or I like doing that job, and you have to be able to balance that with what makes sense for my company. What's our, does this fit in our business plan? Is this where we're going? What, what's the business side of this as well as what, yeah, you yeah. know? Because yeah, we yeah. all tend to get a little personal about, oh, that's that load I did for 10 years. Now they want something that I can't do, either freight, price, something. And I have to go back to that customer and say, we can't do that. It's difficult to do because, hey, man, I've done that forever and that's, that's mine. That's my baby. I want to rock it, you know. And then you have to be able to say, "Hey, I'm going to turn this down and you know seek another opportunity or something to to keep that going." And you know, a lot of that comes back to you over time. But to be that was the hardest thing for me is to say, "Okay, this doesn't make sense for us financially or in a business sense or where we're going." So I'm going to just turn that opportunity down. But, you know, just, yeah, because you know, you, you're start... so used to knocking on doors when you're little, like you said. Well, hey, is there something I can do? You know, how many trucks do you yeah. have? Well, I have two. Well, come back when you have twenty. You know, so you're like, well, how am I going to get twenty if I can't? <laughs> it's so then you call them back and say, hey, when one of the big guys yeah. dropped the ball, will you just call me? And yeah. We built. That's how we built our business. Right. Just, hey, call me. It's you know, an awkward I'm... feeling to say I'm not taking on new customers right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And you know, you know, and you just think, wow, this is not. And so it's that mindset from. You know how if I'm going to grow this business, there's certain things I have to do, and yeah. and you know, but yet how do you manage to keep all of that business? You know, everybody's got trucks, but not everybody has our team. That's what we try to sell. You know, what's what's going to happen when something happens? Who are you going to be partnered with? And, yeah. and it's just yeah, the things that make sense. That's tough, but that's the bit. That's the growing. That's what you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
that we all do because we we tend to we tend to look and think I'm the only one. I'm the only one that's having struggles. I'm the only one that's had hard times. I'm the only one that goes, oh my gosh, how are we going to pay the fuel bill this month or whatever, whatever that happens in and out of the all the years that you're in. And then when you realize everybody has those struggles, whether we want to be honest about it or not. And so that's what I can learn from. I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) if we're all having the struggle, what can we do to, you know, take care of that, you know? Yeah. Just like what you said, if we're all fighting over the same load of freight and we've got the price down to where nobody's making money, what? why are we doing that? Here's a big thanks to Jason and Penny Cowan, Rob and Karen Hallahan, and Nick Hewitt for the benefit of their long experience. You can read more about all three of these small fleet champ finalists, as well as seven other fleets among our semi-finalists, via overdriveonline.com slash small hyphen fleet hyphen champ. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with additional support from Overdrive Extra contributing writer Paul Marhofer, Overdrive News Editor Matt Cole, Social Media Coordinator Holly Young, and Executive Editor Alex Lockie. Until next time, keep it pro out there.